Yeah. You're listening to the Radio Ammo Breakfast, only on Kiwi. Well, every March, one of New Zealand's most glorious wading birds, that is the bar-tailed godwit, takes to the wing and begins its epic journey of around 17,000 kilometres from New Zealand to Alaska to breed. And it's actually around about this time of the year that they return once more. Gosh, it's a long way to go just to uh, just to stay alive, basically. Well, uh, a book has just been written about one particular a godwit. It's called E3 Call Home, the true story of godwit migration and misadventure. It's been written by Janet Hunt, who's an award-winning writer for both children and adults. It's a bit of a children's book, this one. Uh, she also won the New Zealand Post Book of the Year for A Bird in the Hand and the Montana Medal for Nonfiction for Wetlands of New Zealand, A Bittersweet Story. Janet Hunt uh, joins us this morning uh, live from Waiheke. Good morning, Janet. Good morning. Good morning. Now, uh, this this uh, godwitch that you're, you've written about, you, you know this godwit personally, don't you? <laughs> No, I don't really, but I do. In a, in a way, I do because when I was writing the wetlands book in 2007, I was watching what was happening to the godwits, which they had they had put transmitted on some transmitters on some godwits here in New Zealand, and they were posting the uh, the birds' progress as they went north from New Zealand to the to the Yellow Sea. So, you yeah, know, I, I remember there was a, um, a, a, a an item on uh, one of the news programs. That's that, right about it, and. Um, and it was a bit of a harrowing experience for some of these god godwits to actually have these transmitters put put on them, wasn't it? Wasn't That's it? true. Yeah. I think that was probably the, the following year when they actually tried to, because the males are actually quite a lot smaller than the females. They put they put little backpacks on the males. Yeah. And in the females, they actually inserted them into a cavity in their body with a and their ones, the male ones were solar powered and the female ones were battery powered. So there's a big difference in the way that they sort of got their energy to transmit, send the signals back. Yeah. And um, in the first, in the 2007, when it didn't really work for the birds to have the backpacks, the following year they tried putting um, the battery-powered ones inside the little males, but they weren't. It wasn't totally successful, I don't think. And what, what, yeah. well, why is it? In, why is it in recent years that the godwits have um, have been in the media so much? Well, I guess it's just because we've finally got the technology to track them in the way we've we've always known. Well, for a long time we've known that the birds were here in New Zealand and elsewhere in the southern hemisphere and then that they were breeding in the northern hemisphere but people have never really been sure exactly what the route was between the two places. Okay. Uh, and and now we do know from the research that has been done over the past couple yeah, of years? Yeah, well, we have a much better idea. I mean, there's still a lot that we don't know about about the birds because obviously they're, you know, they're here one minute, then they're gone. But, um, you know, we do now know a lot more. We know that they depend on... A staging, what they call a staging site in the Yellow Sea around the around um, South Korea, North Korea, China, in that area there, there's a very important place there because on their way, on the birds' progress north, they have to stop and rest, mm. and um, that's there's big estuaries there which the birds have traditionally sort of used for their staging posts. Now there's an issue uh, with some of those environments at the moment, isn't there? Yes, it's a huge issue. It's because um, the, the population pressure, the human population in those areas is, is enormous. And so the, the pressure on those sort of coastal environments from people is, is huge. Uh, that people are, are considered, well, they're basically damming off the estuaries, putting wall, sea walls across and filling them in. Mm. Now, the, the, um, the godwits are, have quite a special sort of place in the New Zealand uh, landscape because they, they hail the coming of spring, don't they? Have, yes. have, have they actually started coming back now? Are they yes, already yes here? they are, yes. Um, Christchurch, Christchurch City has this lovely tradition of ringing the bells in the city when the birds arrive back, and That's they right. did that about a week ago, I think it was. Yeah, which is, which is it's quite, quite a nice way of actually marking the season. The, the godwits sort of know more about nature than we do. Yeah. In that respect, yes, it's true. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Is, is what about? Tell us about E3. I mean, is E3 still still alive? Yes, as far as we know. Well, yes, yes. One of the important things about this book, the pages that I like the most, are actually right in the back. Because when I was working on the book in April this year, I received an email from somebody who was in Taiwan, and they sent me a photograph of E3 in Taiwan in April. Goodness. This year. So someone there was with a tracker and knew exactly which bird E3 was. Oh yeah, well no, it wasn't the tracker. It was a, um, the bird's got a he's got a flag on his leg that says E3. Right. And you can see it quite clearly. Um, I don't know if you've got a copy of the book, but on on page 37 there he is, standing in the water looking at something that he's going to 
eat any minute. <laughs> and it's um, it's just fantastic to think that he's still out there. And um, travelled all that way? Yes. So well, that's where he was in April. He was in Taiwan. So we assume that since then he's gone to Alaska, probably bred, and we hope that he's back again in New Zealand or, or on his way. They're not all back yet, I don't think. They, they sort of come in little groups over the next month or so. And what do we know about their journey itself? Um, only that they just fly, well, that on the whole, a large number of them fly non-stop, which is just huge across the Pacific. They tend to leave on a, when the weather's looking really good and there's a high, I think it's a high, the winds are blowing well towards the south southern hemisphere. So right. they actually, um, I was at a talk last night with a chap called Brian McCaffrey in New Zealand, and he's been talking about the godwits from the Alaskan end. And he was saying that they, you know, they they seem to know when the weather's good, and they take off and they they fly very high, sometimes two, three kilometres out of sight, really, and head south. And because they're not a big bird, are they? No, they're not. They're only about say thirty centimetres. And are they, I mean, are they quite plump when they leave? You know, are they, they're are they, huge. Right. Yes. They've I eaten. mean, they, they have this amazing cycle because they actually put on about half their body weight again in fat before they depart. Yeah. So they're really, really fat. And then they need they need to use all that fuel to get them to their next point. And so this, this whole thing of putting on weight and then losing weight over the season is, um, over, the, over the year, is actually um, very important. At that point, they'd be quite good eating, wouldn't they, Janet? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> well, certainly they're part of the um, Maori cultural Are harvest. Are they? The, well, they were. Sorry, right. they were. They were yeah. they're not. I don't think. I don't think many people do that now. I mean, not not not, not that we're planning on eating goblets, but, no. but would we imagine that that, that that tastes pretty good? I suppose so. I don't mm. know. They'd be kind of. Hmm. They'd be a bit oily, wouldn't they? They might be very oily. Well, mm. in fact, the fat would be very or would be very oily indeed so but they'd probably have a nice tangy salty taste i suppose i don't know (laughs) of course to any child reading uh e3 call home uh, that would be a highly offensive topic of conversation i'd imagine because you become very attached to this e3 they do actually i was reading it to some children in school about a week ago and uh we had to stop because the bell was going to ring and they were sort of like but what happened but what happened (laughs) yeah is it kind of is it a story kind of like um, do you remember the, the book Storm Boy and he found oh. and he found the seagull or the gull on the beach and it was oh. injured? No, I don't know that story, but yeah. Yeah, I just remember as a child it was you know for some reason stories about birds and epic tales about birds just are really captivating. Yes. yes yeah. Yes. I think it's I think it's perhaps um, the scale. Of, of of this journey. Yes, that's right. The, the fact bird. that they can't you see they can't stop like an albatross would stop and rest on the water. Yeah. These birds don't. Yeah. They're wading birds. They don't have webbed feet. They they're not totally waterproof. They can't stop. So if they if they run out of fuel, they're in trouble. And so that was really the premise of the story was that E three got into trouble. Do we know? Oh right. Yeah. And but, but we don't want to probably give that away, I suppose. Well, well, he was just you know he was on his way and things started to go wrong. <laughs> but is that a true story? It is a true story. Okay. Yes, he had to turn off. Right. But 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 the amazing thing is he's actually now now back with the pack. That's right. He is. Yeah. Yes. How long do Godwits live for? Well, I think um, I read somewhere sort of they think about about twenty years maybe. Well, that's that's a long time. For it a is bird. a long time. Yes. Yes. And I suppose they need to live that long in order to have that kind of, that, that genetic um, uh, message, I That's suppose, true. that tells them, tells the next generation where to go. That's right. Oh, well, I guess so. Yeah, um, I mean, if the memory was so short, they yeah. lived, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not Darwin, but um, <laughs> you well, know, you'd think that, that that would play a part. Yeah, but that's interesting because a lot of the young birds, when they fly to New Zealand, or when they fly back down to the southern hemisphere, I should say, mm. they actually do it without adults. They, they, they're bred on the Arctic tundra, and the adults leave before the young ones to come back. So somehow, and this is one of the world's great mysteries, really, because it we is. don't know how, they, yeah. they, the young ones know where to go. And when you think about it, I was, I was reading somebody saying, you know, in all this vast Pacific Ocean, as they're coming back down, New Zealand is only a tiny little pinpoint in the land, you know, a tiny pinpoint of land in that vast ocean. So how do birds know where to land? Um, some of them go to Australia, of course. Have you read theories on it? Uh, yes. Well, nobody really knows for sure about that one. 
Do we, I mean, do we think it's something to do with magnetic fields? Oh, yes. Well, in terms of migration, they think there's a combination of things. They think, you know, landform, sound, um, the sky, the stars, and the position of sun and moon. Mm. And also, they do seem to have some kind of um, magnetic compassing system in their heads. Mm. Fascinating. Well, it's all um, it it's all contained in, in the book, um, the, uh, the story... Um, for I reckon for for children and adults alike. Yes, that's right. Well, I think of it as a good book for adults to share with children. Yeah. There's a um, sort of like a running footnote that tells you all the scientific stuff as well as a story at the top. So the the story runs through the main part of the book, and then down down the bottom, if you want to, there's a little figure that kind of guides you through a whole lot of stuff about what's going on. Fantastic. Well, the yes. book is called E3 Call Home: A True Story of Godwit Migration. And Miss Adventure Janet Janet Hunt, thanks so much for joining us. Great, thank you.